Good morning, boys and girls. Welcome, Shen Plays. Welcome back to Factorio Beginner Series, Beginner Guide, whatever we're calling this, where we're <laughs> going through the starting steps of how to get started in this game if you're just playing it for the first time. Today, we're going to go into science, and then following that, we're going to do some uh, some furnace line processing, some smelting areas. So, Avak, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing very well, thank you very much. Yourself? Uh, pretty good. I'm, I'm excited to do some science. Now, if Indeed, press... this is this is one of one of the parts that I really really enjoy. It's kind of, as I was saying to Shane between episodes, it's kind of like RPGs when your character levels up and you're like, oh, what am I going to spend my points on? This yep. is what science is to me. So in this game, if you press T, you bring up your science window, and this shows you what's available. The yellow or green, whatever it looks like to you, uh, colored tiles are science things that you can do right now. The red ones are ones that you can do later on. And then the dark green, which or is it dark or bright green, whatever. The dark green right. ones at the very bottom will be ones that are completed already. So in this case, we have available to us automation, logistics, optics, turrets, stone walls, steel processing, tool belt, military, and armor crafting. Well, we're going over what we think is important to do early game and what you can sort of leave to, to a little bit later. Like Avak is really fond of his turrets and I prefer automation. Yes. <laughs> I just like not being the only thing standing between my factory and the enemy. Because oh. that means that I have to stand between my factory and, and I'm, I'm squishy and it hurts when I get bitten. <laughs> it's true. Turrets it's true. have the two advantages. One, they don't care if they get bitten. Two, they shoot much faster than I do and do a lot more damage. And so they're, they're, they use the same ammo as well, though. And they're always accurate. They're never bad. Yes. <laughs> they never shoot a yeah. tree by accident. Never distracted. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, so what, what can we do? We, to do some science, we have in our pocket, we can craft from the production menu uh, an item called a lab. And all your science will be done in these labs. Uh, it takes a long time to to do a science. Like uh, each each, let's go to the science thing here. It tells you if you mouse over it, uh, ten seconds, fifteen seconds, ten seconds, ten seconds, five seconds, thirty seconds for each of these little science thingamahoozits. And yeah, no, that, don't that, get this confused with producing the science because you do actually need to. The, if we go back to crafting just briefly. There are different types of science packs. There's four in total, but we could, we've only got access to two right now, and they're called mm -hmm. Science Pack 1, Science Pack 2, or some people call them beakers or flasks. And each one of these has a crafting time. requires a certain amount of ingredients or crafting time. But the research is how fast a single lab will consume a single list of the components. Now, right now, most of, all, most of these components only require one, one type of, of science pack. Later on, they'll require different types. Now, it's worth noting here that, for example, if it says 10 seconds and it has one red flask, as is the case with a turret, every 10 seconds, it will consume one red flask and it needs to consume 10 to research that technology. If it shows, for example, laser turrets, which require 50 red flasks and 50 green flasks, and it, each one takes 30 seconds, each lab will consume every 30 seconds one red and one green, and it will need to do that 50 times. It's not split between the two. It's, it needs 50 batches of red and green science every 30 seconds before that research is done. Mm -hmm. So the way, the way you figure out how long it'll take to do any research is you take, for instance, on the automation, auto, automation research, it says it takes 10 seconds for each cycle of research, and there are mm -hmm. 10 total cycles of research. So 10 times 10 takes 100 seconds total. Not that bad. Yeah. But then you start looking at, uh, like he was meant, like Avak was mentioning laser turrets, and my goodness, 30 second cycle time, and it's 50 cycles. That yeah. is what, 1,500 seconds? That is a long time. It is worth noting though, that you can spread this work out across multiple labs. And let's go ahead and place some labs down and then we will continue chatting about how All to right. use them. I'll build two labs in my pocket. I'll just build one because I'm... A oh, you've already bit, built it. <laughs> bit of a miser. So there's now labs, one lab. Labs do need to be on your electric network, so just make sure it's close to a telephone pole. Yeah, exactly. Now, as you can imagine, if it has 10 cycles, as if we look at automation, 10 flasks need to be consumed or 10 cycles of one flask. If you've got two labs, then each one only needs to go through the cycle five times, and in total, you will have uh, will have consumed 10 flasks. So you can basically share the work out and get the work done twice or however many times more quickly. Yep. So if we want to go ahead and pick our first 
research task. In this case, I'm going to start off with automation. Uh, yeah. Avac can change it to whatever he would like later on. Uh, then the lab itself will say, okay, I'm trying, I'm trying to produce one of the cycles of automation technology. There's only 10 cycles total, but it's trying to produce one right now, but it can't do it because it doesn't have its input. Its input are these four different colors of flasks. And if we mouse over it, it says it needs the red ones right now. So Avac, do you have any red flasks for us? No, but I am making some right now. It does take time. Now, later on, you can automate this. But in the in the beginning, th then this is part of what Factorio is. Everything you're trying to do is trying to move first towards a point where you can get your factory to do it for you. Because in most cases, your factory can do it faster or better than you can. But initially, a lot of the, the early game is building that initial level of automation. It's why automation is such a good technology to take in the beginning. Now I've got five flasks, well six flasks. I'm going to go ahead and pop a couple of these in there. So there's five, well now there's six. Now there's and 11. And we'll slowly build up. There we are. <laughs> now you'll notice there's a bit of a progress bar here and that's based on the cycle time. It's worth noting that if you've got like, for example, if we have three labs, that doesn't neatly divide 10 flasks into it. So there would be progress left over. The labs will remember the, how much of the flask they've consumed. You'll notice there's a little progress bar on the flasks themselves that's slowly ticking down. So you don't have to worry about using exact quantities of labs to not waste any flasks. You won't. They they are intelligent enough to protect us from ourselves. Mm -hmm. Overflow is perfectly fine. It will flow into the next research you do. It's not a problem. Mm -hmm. And if we have Alt turned on, you can see that these labs currently have in them Red beakers, if or red red flasks. Sorry, they're Erlenmeyer flasks. If you had green flasks, purple flasks, or blue flasks, they would also appear uh, in here as well. And this is one of the ways you can figure out what is missing from your science. Uh, a lot of times you run into a situation where science isn't being done. You're like, oh, what's going on, Avac? Why isn't science being done? It's like, oh, we're missing blue beakers or missing green beakers. You can tell just by pressing Alt real quick what's missing, yep. and then you can track that back through your factory to find out where things are going wrong. Now, if we look at the technology screen again, you'll see that the what Shen was mentioning earlier, it's a nice bright green at the bottom there showing us that this automate that this research is now done. Mm -hmm. You'll notice that we haven't got less um yellow available researchers because automation was a prerequisite to one of the later texts and that's now available for us. But just to cover quickly why automation was a worthwhile research to take early on, it allowed us to start researching the electronics technology but right away once we've got it we can now build assembling machines and long-handled inserters one thing i mentioned with inserters previously is they take directly from the tile next to them and put it into the tile on the other side of them the long-handled ones do two tiles so they'll take from two tiles away and put two tiles away from themselves so it's just extending the reach of your logistics but it is the assembly machine that Shen was hankering after there. This is the first step in automation and it allows you to automate the construction, the crafting of certain goods. Yeah, think of think of the automation machines as your own self, duplicated, stationary, and slow. It crafts <laughs> it crafts the exact same way you do, but it crafts at half the speed. If you if yes. you mouse over it, where is it? Here it is in the product production crafting menu. Mouse over it, it says it has crafting speed of 0 0.5. So it's half as fast as you are. But the nice thing about it, if you notice when we were crafting the beaker, I'll make some more of these flasks right now. If you're crafting the flasks, uh, look how long it takes to produce one flask. That cycle time is huge. But if you put them into, um, if you put them into a, an automated factory thing, the, uh, what is it called, assembly machine, then it will do it on its own and you can come back to it later on, pick up the flasks and you're done. You don't have to have it crafting in your pocket the entire time. And this is one of the things that you'll run into frequently in this game is you'll find an object. You're like, oh, I want one of those, like a, an oil derrick or whatever. And it takes so long to build in your pocket. You're like, you know what? This is this is filling up my pocket space. It's taking too much of my pocket's time. And your pocket construction is important because if you need to defend yourself, you have to be able to produce ammo in a split second or build a wall or build a turret. But if you can automate it, then it will do it on its own. It doesn't matter how long it takes. You can come back and pick it up later. And that really is where assembly machines become fantastic. Now, what I'm going to do, since we've now started to uh, work towards automating our production, I've got an assembly machine I just made. It required... 
three electrical circuits, five iron gears, nine iron plates. It's not a lot. It's just 22 iron and 4.5 copper. You can get better assembly machines, by the way, because Shen was mentioning that this is slower than you are. The later ones become much better. We're going to set this up to make the beakers for us. So the, the red science pack, which requires two iron and one copper. Now, that's the raw resources. At this point, you need to stop looking at raw because the assembly machine can't just take two iron and one copper and then m make the gear wheel and then make the science pack. It has to be given the gears. So we're going to set that up as a science pack one. We're going to need another factory. Shen, do you have a factory built? I have five of them. Wonderful. If you place one down with one tile space between them, because you'll notice that this does not have an output. It requires us to have inserters to hand the output, uh, the um, the input and output to them. So, for example, here we're going to place an inserter there. Unfortunately, over here, we're going to need to move around the electricity a little bit just to make sure it covers everything in here. But we'll just place one there. Or, or Shen will place one. Ah, damn it, Shen. <laughs> Don't worry about it. So in this case, uh, this, this assembly machine requires copper plates, which we already have them being produced. Right here, we have a yes. box full of copper plates, and mm -hmm. we're, we're producing a ton of them down here at this little area. Uh, but it also requires a produced item. It requires a, uh, what do you call this? A semi, a semi product. It's not the final product. It's what you use to build the final product. Iron gear wheels are, build, are, are used to build tons of things in this game. So we're gonna have these factories here make iron gear wheels. And when you click on, when you place a factory down, you left click on it and then you select its recipe. So we're gonna pick the iron gear wheel recipe. And you can see here, iron gear wheels require iron plates. Makes sense, right? And since we already know a lot about belts, why don't we bring some belts over here and take the plates sure. off of belts? By all means, if you want to set that up, I'll make the inserters to put the iron onto a belt. There we go. Okay. All right, we're gonna to need to come down just one tile so that we've got room for the inserters themselves. We're also going to need to bring some electricity over here to run the inserters. There we go. You got it, fantastic. So what's happening now is iron is being, now this, this is where factories start looking amazing. Iron is being produced by drilling into the ground. That iron ore is being put into furnaces. That produced iron plate is being put onto a belt by inserters. Those inserters, uh, those iron plates are going down the belt to these inserters, which are then feeding these assembly machines, which are then making the iron gear wheels. This inserter pushes the iron gear wheel from one factory to the next one, and then it goes into the beaker assembly machine, which is now waiting on copper plates. So where do we get our copper plates? Well, rather than running the belt over here, because that'll start to make things look a little bit messy, though this is part of of the, the factories, the logistics and, and how to lay down the belt. We mm -hmm. will actually have a method, much like we've got the pipe to ground over here, of making underground belts oh. later on. And that would be very useful here. But in lieu of that, we'll just go ahead and manually move a stack of copper over here into a little chest. And then that chest can then be automatically supplying this factory and you can see all of the arms starting to get to work oh, because yeah. this is now producing the the flasks now one thing to note about factories is whilst they do have an internal storage it is much smaller than you would normally expect they won't stack things in the same way you can stack them in a chest so this isn't going to just make an enormous stack of red uh, science packs it's only going to make a couple and then it's going to stop. It's like, well, I've got nowhere to put it, so I'm not going to waste time and power making more. So Correct. we need to make an output. Factories work, or I'm sorry, not factories, assembly machines work very well if you link them up like we have here. You go from one machine to the next machine to the next machine and so on. But you're going to need a storage space, either a belt, uh, a, a wooden box, or later on you get steel boxes. You're probably going to want an assembly machine. I, I'm sorry. You're probably going to want a storage for input and a storage for output. That way, your machines always have the resource that they need and that uh, will never just sit idle. In this case, the flasks are going to be put onto a belt. I'll go ahead and put them there with, with a I've little. I actually just realized sitter. that I'm going to preempt something here. Oh. And that is that our, our assembly machine is basically going. We ha don't have enough room to put uh, belts all the way around our science lab. Wow. So, so if we, we move, move them slightly, yeah. yeah, we can make a loop going all the way around 
so that we're not going to have to worry about all of our sciences ending uh, stacked up on one side of the belt like mm -hmm. we have with the coal. Mm -hmm. uh, we may as well just uh, place them around here. It's good enough. It's enough room away from where the, uh, they are being produced. You want to place down the other two that you picked up? Got it. And then we can just make... You only need one tile gap for the inserters, or if you really want to, you can have a two tile gap now that we've got the long handled inserters. If you want to go ahead and place down some more belts, I need to make some more belts. Okay, no problem. And I will drop off the science packs that I had previously. So there in this go. case, Avac was mentioning doing a loop, and this is one of the common ways to set up your science. It's It may not be the best way, it's just a way that um, some people do. Another way you can do science is to put a belt between two rows of, uh, of labs. That works just fine, too. Mm -hmm. This is not the most efficient way of setting up a loop either, but later on we will research different types of belts and different uh, specific like, um, utility sections of belts, such as tunnels or what's called splitters. This is a very cheap and, and, and easy way of setting this up. But as you can see now, we're researching turrets, and where the belts need to take some science, they'll just pick it off the belt. So mm -hmm. it's all nice and easy for us. So this is now effectively automated. Only if the science requires just red science packs. Later on when they require more, we're going to have to make a much more complicated layout to handle that. But that's half the fun of this game. Yep. A lot of this game is organization, uh, learning, learning different types of efficiency, finding things that are aesthetically pleasing to yourself, and just... I mean, that, that's just a great way to have fun in this game. I really enjoy setting things up and just watching them work. <laughs> <laughs> now, turrets have been researched. Mm -hmm. Now, this is something that I care a lot about, as I mentioned before, because I don't like dying, and I don't mind if a turret does in my place. So we have already researched that, and that literally just gives us access to the gun turret, but it also allows some other research. Now, we can increase gun turret damage. It makes... The, the, for the same bullet, it's going to do more damage per shot. But you'll also notice that it allows laser turrets, but that is in red still, and it's still not up available. That's because the laser turret has more than one base technology as a prerequisite. We also need batteries and we need lasers. So just for it allowing something, it just means that it, it will clear its uh, component requirement for that research technology. So do check the, the technology itself rather than just looking at what a previous technology allows. Otherwise, you may end up like, well, why can't I get lasers? I just researched gun turrets and that's what I wanted. I just wanted the lasers. You need other things first. Mm -hmm. uh, right, the next thing, I'm going to say we should go for walls because walls, you know, work well with turrets. Put turrets on uh, wall on the other side of the turret and the the enemies are going to have to break through the wall first before they can damage the turret, but the turret's still going to be able to shoot over the walls. Okay, sounds fine to me. Uh, in the meantime, why don't we use some of our wonderful resources that we've collected here, and let's go ahead and build a little smelting zone for this iron, because you can see we're using a lot of iron. These assembly machines yes. themselves, assembly machines require 22 iron each, but only four and a half copper. That's not that much copper. Same no. thing with uh, labs require 36 iron. Red beakers require... Uh, a lot of iron. We're going to go through a lot of, of red beakers for sure. And that just means we're going to need to be smelting iron all the time, all day, every day. And you're going to want to have right, yeah. a, a large area set up for smelting. You're going to want to have an area for smelting iron, an area for smelting copper, and so on. In this case, we need some stone furnaces. So I've picked up a bunch of stone. And nice thing about stone furnaces, they build in your pocket in half a second. They're so fast. <laughs> yeah. So While you're doing that, I'm going to start working on making a bunch more uh, conveyor belts because you are going to work through this stuff crazy, crazy fast. Yes, sir. I'm going, to set, up, I'm going to set up an initial area of, um, let's say, 10 smelting. Okay, just, yep. that, that's a convenience, or not convenience, it's a conservative amount of smelting to be done. Yes. And we're going to do five on each side here. And one of the reason, one of the things that's going to look a little awkward is I'm leaving gaps. And the reason I'm leaving gaps is because we're going to be upgrading this from stone furnaces to uh, electric furnaces at some point. Not yet, but at some point. And when we do that, electric furnaces take up more space. They take up, yes. uh, is it three by three instead of two by two? They're, they're, yeah. just, they're just a exactly. little bigger. And the difference in size can be accounted for uh, just by leaving a little gap when you do your initial setup. By gap, what, what Shen means here is that 
whereas down here we've got the inserter arms taking straight out of the furnace and dropping onto a belt that's running parallel to the, the line of the furnaces, he's got he's going to have an inserter that's just dropping onto a belt that runs onto another belt. It might have looked a little bit odd to start with, but that's why that is, just so that we can get rid of that later on. It's not necessary for the build. Mm -hmm. Okay, so right now... Uh, let's see, why don't we pull this the other direction? This usually takes a few minutes to set up as far as uh, trying to figure out how you want to orient your belts, how you want the materials to flow along the belts. And uh, one thing to note about setting up smelting zones is you're going to need two inputs because the yes. smelters require fuel, but they also require a resource. So in this case, we're smelting iron. So we need to have iron come in somehow. And we also need to have the fuel in the form of coal or wood come in somehow. So I have two input areas and one output area for the iron plates. Uh, I'm currently researching logistics because we need, uh, what are they called? Uh, underground belts. We also need splitters. And these are two wonderful little objects that allow you to manage your belts. Just like, just like we can manage pipes by putting some of it underground, we can do the same thing with belts. Yep. And what splitters do is they allow you to turn one belt into two belts or vice versa, two belts into one belt. And, and that, it'll that'll... share the in, the resources going through the splitter onto each belt. So it, it'll, mm -hmm. it, it can also be used just to make your belt a bit more efficient in certain ways as well. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Right. Well, I've made a couple of long-handled inserters. Now, the thing we need here is, as you've noted, there, there are belts running two abreast along here. We're going to need to be able to take things off both sides of the, the belt. So uh, Rather, both belts. So. Here we go. We'll just set this up nice and easy along I'll do here. The shorthanders when you do the long. There we are. And there we go. So this setup now, all it requires is for us to deliver the re raw resources and the coal to it. Now that's all that's going to require is that we just set up um, the miners here just a little bit differently to bring the iron up. And we can go ahead and do that now. Honestly, I'll just take apart the furnaces that we've got going and we can start moving things around now you'll notice that i'm actually taking a little bit longer than normal to to break things down it's because my pick wore down they are <laughs> they do have a durability and eventually they break so bear that in mind there are also better better picks that you can get later on as well now if we just remove all of this then we can quickly hook up the line of the smell treat going straight down, and this will just feed straight along here. Okay, so in this oh, yeah, case, we're going to have belts that go north-south instead of east-west, because we're going to have the ore go north into the uh, smelting area, and then we're going to split it maybe around, hmm, let's say, here. Now, the splitters, is, it's worth noting, actually require electronic circuits there. Uh, it's a total of, of 16 metal, uh, sorry, 16 iron and 7.5 copper. And the, it's worth having a couple of these on hand because you're always going to need them. Oh, yes. Likewise, underground belts, very much like the pipe to ground, they require a certain amount of transport belts. That is five. You don't have to place them. You place them exactly the way that you do with uh, underground pipes. And that means you don't need to have them running their maximum distance. So if you do it shorter, you are effectively wasting some resources Correct. there. And that's worth bearing in mind. But you will be doing it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All the time. Yes. Right. Then so here's an example of an underground out, area then. here. One there, one there. And they don't have a very long range, just five tiles. But it's still very, very useful. The underground belts are amazing. Yes, very much uh, so. Also, yeah, there are three different types of belts. There's yellow, red, and blue. And I didn't really want to get into them this early, but it's important to note that you cannot hook up... Uh, I mean, you can hook up red, green, and blue belts to different colored uh, undergrounds, and it'll work just fine. Yeah, yeah. Effectively, the only difference between the belts is how fast they can move resources along them. It's, just, it's literally the belt just moves a little bit faster. And it's the same for the inserters. The long-handled inserter is... Uh, a bit of a difference in that it actually reaches from a greater distance, but the blue inserter is simply a fast inserter. It just operates a little bit faster. Later on, you can get inserters that actually have some additional features as well, and we'll cover those when we get to them. Sounds good. So can you hook up the uh, coal over there, please? I certainly can. I'll I am, just run this I back. am out of belts. I don't know how I did that. <laughs> 
<laughs> out of belt. I can. There make we more. go. <laughs> so yeah, you're gonna run out now, of belts a lot in this game. <laughs> yes, it's worth noting, however, that for a little while we haven't been attacked, and that's because we weren't producing pollution. Now our Steam engines don't produce pollution. They produce steam. And steam isn't pollution, it's water vapor. What produces the pollution is the boilers that are powering them. So when our steam engines were working at a very low level, they, there wasn't much pollution being made. Effectively, we've taken all of the pollution-producing structures and clustered them in certain locations. The uh, smelters produce pollution because they're burning coal locally, and the boilers produce pollution. Now... When a, a miner, when a belt gets backed up all the way to the miner, the miner simply stops working. It's not pulling power at that point. It's only pulling power if it's doing a job. So for a time, because our coal belt was completely backed up, because um, many of our other systems, for example, the copper belts here, well, they're not the belts, but the, the smelters themselves are full, the miners aren't doing any work. So they're not pulling energy. The boilers aren't running. Not much pollution is being created. However, now that we've done this, a lot of pollution is going to start being made, and that is going to upset some of the natives. What are the natives called, by the way? Biters. They have a fun name, don't they? Biters. Oh, they're actual, yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so you can also see this is... Spitters. You can see this is working pretty well so far. Um, and I, this, like I was saying, is these 2x2 two two furnaces are going to be replaced by 3x3 three three electric furnaces later on. So we're leaving a uh, one tile gap around them in all directions so that we can just plunk down the electric furnaces and everything will be perfectly fine. That's right. But on that note, I think we will wrap this up here. Off camera, we'll probably go ahead and set up a very small uh, smelter for the copper in much the same way we've done for the iron here. Copper is never quite used, or at least early on in the game, isn't used with the same sort of frequency as iron. You want a large mining and smelting operation for iron pretty early on, honestly. But with copper, not nearly uh, as, as uh, frequently used. But this gives you a good idea of just how large of an area you're going to need to get a reasonable production of some of these resources. Yep. And why don't we uh, say goodbye here? Thank you for joining okay. us. Hope you enjoyed this little introduction into dealing with science, setting up a little bit of science production. Uh, now that we have underground belts and stuff, we will off screen uh, moving some copper over here instead of using a box because there's no need to have a box here. We'd, we'd rather have it come straight from the uh, straight from the it's ore. And uh, yep. that that will be that will be it. So thanks for watching. Yep. I've been Shen. He's been Avac. We'll see you next time for more Factorio Beginner Guide. Take care, everyone.